Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Glad you're here. Good to see you. Yes, sir. Are you ready for the word? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Turn to Exodus 12. We're going to start reading in verse 1, but before we do, let me remind you of something we've talked about here lately several times. In John 5, our Messiah said, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. When you read Torah correctly, you see that Moses was writing about the Messiah. And when you read Exodus 12, you see clearly that he's writing about the Messiah. So let's start reading there. Verse 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. What are the two Hebrew words translated beginning of months? Rosh Hodesh. Rosh Hodesh. It shall be the first month of the year to you. What are the Hebrew words translated there, first month? You remember that one? Rishon Hodesh. Rishon Hodesh. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. That's significant in the tenth day of this month. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. In the King James it says, in the evening. But the Hebrew word translated in is the Hebrew word bain. B-E-Y-N. What does bain mean? Between. Betwixt or between. So you shall kill it between the evenings. They shall take the take of the blood, strike it on the two side post and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not it raw nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. You shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the Elohims of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. Amen. And, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Why forever? Because Moses is not just setting up a memorial about their deliverance from Egypt. He's writing about the Messiah. If all Moses had done was write about what Yahweh did to deliver them from Egypt, and if that is all that it was about, it would still be worthy of our attention. If this was just about that and nothing else, those who love Yahweh and those who worship Yahweh should want to know everything they can about this event and the instruction that's given here in Exodus 12 and also in Leviticus 23. Because what Yahweh did there was miraculous. What Yahweh did there was astounding. It was a display of power. It was a display of majesty. It was a display of faithfulness. He had made Abraham a promise, and he's fulfilling that promise. It, 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 it was not just a display of his power over the kingdoms of men. Verse 14 states it clearly. Excuse me, not verse 14, but verse 12 states it clearly. It was also a display of his power over principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. It says in verse 12 that, that he would make uh, execute judgment against the Elohims 
that were over Egypt. There were powers of darkness at work against Israel and Egypt. And Yahweh delivered the children of Israel from those powers with a mighty hand. So how can anyone who claims to love Yahweh not want to know then about this established feast that Yahweh sanctified and said was to be observed as a memorial forever? Even if, it was, if, if that was all it was about was what happened in Egypt that night, it's still worthy of being observed, right? right? However, that's not what it's all about. Right. Moses was actually writing about the Messiah. And he was setting up a feast 1,400 years in advance that would be a shadow of things to come. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. A perfect shadow of what was to come. Moses told us how Yahweh would ultimately deliver us from the power of darkness. Exodus 12, he tells us that. Yahweh would not do it with a mighty army, and he would not do it with an angelic host. He would deliver us the same way he delivered them. He would deliver us with a lamb without spot and without blemish. He not only told us what he would do and how he would do it, he told us when Yahweh would deliver us from the powers of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. The information in Exodus 12 tells us when Yahweh would do it. He would do it on the 14th day of the first month of the year, which is called the month of Abib. The precision of pattern shown in Exodus 12 concerning the Messiah's sacrifice for us, when you take the time to look at it, that precision is breathtaking. Yahweh made sure that he would know the exact moment he made sure that we would know the exact moment of our deliverance. Look back in verse 2. This month shall be unto you Rosh Hodesh, translated beginning of months. It shall be Rishon Hodesh, the first of the month of the year to you. This month, the month they were in was to be marked so that all future generations would know when their deliverance would take place. He said it is Rosh Hodesh, means head, chief, or top. Rishon Hodesh means the first. So he marked it as the head month, the chief month, and he also marked it as the first month. Why does he want it marked as the head month, the chief month? Because if it's not marked, man will not know when his deliverance is to take place. If some other calendar is used other than his calendar, then men will not be aware of when their deliverance comes. Why does he want it marked as the first month of the year? If you're going to count and calculate, you have to have a starting point. If you were to say to me today, where do you live? How do I get to your house? What's the first thing I'd ask you? You know what the first thing I'd ask you would be, don't you? What's your address? Where, where are you coming from? Where are you going to be coming from? I need to know where you're coming from in order to tell you how to get to where right. I am. Well, it's the same when you're talking about time. Finding a place in time is the exact same way. In order to get where you need to be, when you need to be there, you need to have a starting point. The starting point for all of Yahweh's appointed times is this month, which is called a bead. So you have to mark it. You have to recognize it as the chief. You have to recognize it as the first. You have to pinpoint it. And then you can find all the other appointed times that Yahweh has for you. The world would have us believe it doesn't matter what calendar we use. They think to use any other calendar than the Gregorian calendar is nonsense. But anyone who will take the time to look and to consider can easily see that the serpent has worked overtime to make men forsake biblical calculations of time because if he can make us forsake biblical calculations of time, he can hide from us the appointed times of Yahweh. Not only... Was he trying to hide from our sight the things Yahweh did? But he's also trying to hide from our sight the things that Yahweh is yet to do. Four of the seven feasts, we've mentioned this many times, but it's worthy of repetition. Four of the seven feasts, four of the seven Moedim were fulfilled precisely within the time frame revealed by those feasts. Passover. Unleavened bread, first fruits, and Shavuot or Pentecost all took place precisely when the feast said that they would take place. 
Is that right? I mean, it, precisely. Let's go to the last one, Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Precisely at that moment is when the Holy Spirit was given. You'd have to be spiritually dead or mentally dense to not realize that the other three are also revealing to us the time frames of when Yahweh will do what he is yet to do. That's right. If the other four came at precisely the times the feast said, the next three will come at precisely the times right. the feast say. That's right. So, Yeshua said, Moses wrote of me. And when we examine what Moses wrote, we see that Moses didn't write about the Messiah in vague terms. He was very exact with his information. In Exodus 12, he told us that the Messiah would be the Lamb of Yahweh without spot or blemish, who would deliver us by his blood. And he told us that he would be killed when? Say again. The 14th day of the month of Abib is when he would be killed. That's precise. Some 1,400 years before it takes place. Moses is telling you the Messiah will come. He's not going to be a king. He's going to be a lamb. He'll be killed on the 14th day between the evenings. The 14th day of the month of Abib. Now to understand this, we have to know how we're supposed to calculate time according to Yahweh. That's right. Now, now this is important because if we don't know how to calculate time per his instruction, we'll miss the precision and beauty of his feast. It's also important because if we don't know how to calculate time per his instruction, we'll be unaware of future events that are yet to take place. Now, to those who are spiritually dead, to those who have no desire to follow Torah, how to calculate time has no concern to them. They're not concerned about it at all. But to those who have the faith of Yeshua and keep the commandments, as Revelation 14 speaks about, then, then how... To calculate time becomes extremely important to you, to us, right? So how do we calculate time? Well, you certainly can't do it using a Gregorian calendar. It will frustrate you, yeah. right? right. <clears throat> it's days and months are named after false gods. That ought to be a clue to us. Yeah, that's right. That this is not the one we follow if we want to keep Yahweh's appointed time. It has no interest in Yahweh in his appointed times. Its intent is actually to hide those things from you. Yeah. So for those who refuse to look outside of the Gregorian calendar and who think it's ridiculous and unnecessary to try and understand what the Bible says about calculating times, then those people will remain blind to the things the enemy wants them blinded to because the Gregorian calendar reveals nothing. You can't follow it. You can't use it. So how do we calculate time per biblical instruction? Well, you can't use a Gregorian. So in our early days, and when we began our journey, we turned to the Hillel 2 calendar. What's the proper name, the more common name for the Hillel 2 calendar? Anybody know? It's just referred to as the Jewish calendar. And if you were to Google, if you were to go on Google right now and say, when is Passover 2019? More than likely you would be given an answer using the quote-unquote Jewish calendar, the Hillel 2 calendar. And as I said, <clears throat> when we realized we couldn't use the Gregorian in our journey, we turned to this Jewish calendar. Uh, surely we thought it, if it's the Jewish calendar, then its calculations of time are going to be the correct ones and we can follow those. But after further study... We found out that the Hillel 2 calendar does not calculate time per biblical instruction and therefore cannot be used as a source for setting the dates for Yahweh's appointed times. Uh, we went over this a couple of years ago and I'm just briefly going to mention it now. You can anybody, just go Google Hillel calendar and study it or Jewish calendar and study it for yourself. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning because we spent a lot of time on it a couple of years ago. But, but let me simply say this about the Hillel 2 calendar. This calendar is based on a 19-year cycle. Every 19 years, it resets itself. And here's how it works. Year 1 has 12 months. Year 2 has 12 months. Year 3 has 13 months. That month is called the month of Adar, A-D-A-R. It's called the pregnant year. Year 4 has 12 months. Year 5 has 12 months. Year 6 has 13 
Year 7 has 12. Year 8 has 13. Year 9 has 12. Year 10 has 12. Year 11 has 13. Year 12 has 12. Year 13 has 12. Year 14 has 13 months. Year 15 has 12. Year 16 has 12. Year 17 has 13. Year 18 has 12. Year 19 has 13. So years 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17, 19 all have 13 months. Seven months and a 19, or excuse me, seven years and a 19 year cycle. Seven of those years have 13 months. This calendar has to do that because it's 11 days shorter than a solar year. So ever so often they, they have to add a month. And in that 19-year cycle, if they add seven 30-day months, they make up the 11 days they lose every year over a 19-year span of time. <clears throat> the point that, that needs to be made, you don't have to understand that. The point that needs to be made is this calendar is not what Yahweh intended for us to follow. Once you discover that, that, that it's not trustworthy, not a trustworthy source to use, where do you turn then? Some people have turned to what they call the Enoch calendar. Now the problem with Enoch's calendar is that it is based on a 364 day year. Some turn to the calendar used by the Karaite Jews. And, and again, if you want to know about that, I'm just going to ask you to Google it. Karaite, K-A-R-A-I-T-E. Now, two things they emphasize and look for in order to start a new year. One of them is the sighted moon. And the other is barley in the Abib stage. They look for those two things. The sighted moon and barley in the, the Abib stage. Does anybody remember what the Abib stage means? Mm -hmm. Barley in the Abib stage means what? The, the, the grain is in the head. Grain is in the full head. It's really reached its, its full size. But it's got the starch in it, but it hasn't dried out. The starch is still in it. It hasn't dried out. So it is matured to the point of full growth but it hasn't dried out yet. So that's called the Abib stage. Why does that matter? Because in Exodus 9, we're told that when the hail came, uh, as one of the plagues that the hail uh, destroyed the barley, which was in the Abib stage. So we know what month by that description. Now my issue with, with uh, their process here is number one, I don't believe the sighted moon is a reliable means of calculating the new moon and thus the new year. Um, what if it's cloudy or rainy and you can't see it? The movement of the moon and the stars are precise. They are with mathematical precision. And uh, so, so I believe waiting on the sighting of it as saying, okay, that's when it starts gets us in trouble. And I also believe that, that too much emphasis is being put on the barley. The barley is a witness that the new year has begun or it is about to begin. But, but Yahweh set three things in the heavens for us to keep time with. What three things did he put in the heavens as our clock? Sun, moon, and stars. That's exactly right. <clears throat> Those calculate time. Those are where we're to be looking. The barley is a witness. In America, when a new year is about to begin, we have other witnesses. You understand? You may not have barley outside your house, but you've got other witnesses that a new year is about to begin. What might be some of those witnesses? Buds on trees. Dogwoods start blooming. Daffodils start popping up, right? Those are signs to you a new year is about to begin. Everything's been dead. But here comes the dogwoods. Here come the daffodils. Signaling to you that the stars are coming into a line to begin a new year. Time is calculated according to Genesis 1 by the sun, by the moon, by the stars. The sun calculates days. The moon calculates months. The stars calculate years. <coughs> With that in mind, let me make some important statements here concerning time. Every day, every new day begins with the disappearing of the sun. 
The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. So every day does not begin with the rising of the sun. Every new day begins with the setting of the sun. Every new moon marks the beginning of a new month. Hodesh means month. Its root meaning means to rebuild. So every new moon signals the rebuilding of another month. Every new moon begins then with the disappearing of the moon. Just like a day begins with the disappearing of the sun, every new month begins with the disappearing of the moon. Not so much the reappearing of the moon. Once the moon disappears, that is our signal that a new month is about to begin. Nothing in Torah, here's my third statement, nothing in Torah says that the barley has to be in the Abib stage before you can start a new month. Torah simply lets us know that the barley had reached that stage during this month. Number four, the stars move with precision and establish for us seasons and years. That's what they do. But the stars do not establish when the first month of the year is. It does not have that power. The stars tell you when a new year begins, but the new month of that year has to be dictated by the moon. The moon tells you when the first month of that year begins. <clears throat> Just because the stars announce a new year is about to begin, they cannot establish the first day of the new year. The moon will do that. Always does. It has superior power there. So how do you establish a new moon? There's only two ways to establish it. Either through sighting of the crescent or through calculating the conjunction. I've already stated that I have issues with waiting on the sighting of the crescent. That puts, to me, puts man in charge of starting a new month hindered by his limitations. A day does not begin when the sun rises. A day begins when the sun sets. Likewise, I believe that a new month does not begin when you can see the new moon. A new month begins when the old one ends. This process is done by calculating its conjunction. The conjunction of the moon is a word that refers to the phase of the moon when it is in direct center between the earth and the sun. It is hidden, it is dark, its cycle has ended. The best illustration I know to use to explain the conjunction is if you were looking at a clock. If you were looking at a clock and you, all three hands were at the 12 o'clock mark, you had the hour hand there, the minute hand there, and the second hand there. They're all three precisely in that place. The moment that that second hand clicks forward or eases forward, a new minute has begun. A new hour has begun. It doesn't wait till it makes another round to say, okay, we've started a new minute. The, the, the instant it moves, a new minute has begun. Well, it's the same way when the moon hits that point of conjunction. When it hits that point of saying, okay, this month is over, as soon as it moves again, a new month has begun. How do we know when that happens? By mathematical precision or by living outside. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and observing it. Let me remind you that in 1 Samuel 20, David talking to Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is the new moon. He didn't have to wait to see it to announce that. It had been calculated. He knew when it would be. You cannot wait until it's seen to start the new month. Now it may take one, two, or three days before it to become visible. It may rain for a week. So you can't wait for that. The new month began the moment the moon moved out of its conjunction. The sighting of the crescent is the same as the barley and the abib stage in my thinking. They're just a visible witness that the new month and the new year did begin. 
They testify as witnesses of what we know to be true from the other sources. The stars tell us when the new year starts. The month tells us, or when the yeah, new year starts. The month tells us when the new month starts. <laughs> the moon. And, and the sun tells us about days. Um, now, having said all that, not everybody agrees with that. Some said Passover started last month. That the month of Abib started 30 days ago, some 30 days ago. And they celebrated Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits last month. The Jewish calendar this year says that the month of Abib started on the evening of April the 6th. That's the reason that you will see that we are observing Passover one day before them. Because by basing the, the new month on the moon's conjunction, we set the new year beginning on the evening of April the 5th. So we're one day earlier than the Jewish calendar says. Well, who's right? If it bothers you that there are three different opinions as to when it starts, and it causes you to scoff at the attempts to properly calculate the appointed times using the sun, moon, and stars. Here's what I would say to that. Number one, I wish that the ancient knowledge of exactly how to calculate it had not been lost to the disobedience of man and the, dis the, the deceivableness of Satan. That's the first thing I'd say. I wish that that knowledge had not been lost. But having said that, I wouldn't rather have three different dates set for marking the month of Abib and celebrating Passover than to continue through the apathy and blindness of following the Gregorian calendar and thinking that, 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 that the fourth month, that we are in the fourth month and, and thinking that Easter has anything to do with the resurrection of our Messiah. Amen. To me, it's ridiculous for anyone who follows the Gregorian calendar and never questions why Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox to scoff at anyone who's trying to understand the biblical concepts of time. For those of us who are seeking to understand these things, I know it can be troubling to see that there can be three different opinions concerning the new month and new year. And if there are three different opinions of when the new month and new year is, then you understand that there, for the rest of the year, there will be di three different opinions about when the other feasts should be celebrated. Yes. Because they all begin with this. So as we go through the year, there will be three different time groups, times that, that groups are celebrating the feast. I understand that's troubling, uh, that, that we all don't arrive at the same answer. But, but here's where I am I am at personally concerning the matter. I'd rather be wrong looking for the answer. I'd rather be wrong seeking answers than wrong because I don't care if my calendar tells me that Easter is when I am by tradition to celebrate the resurrection. I'd rather be wrong seeking answers than, than be wrong because I never cared to find out what the uh, why the biblical instruction concerning my redemption got contaminated with a Babylonian fertility god, her eggs, her rabbit, and sun worship. I'd rather be wrong seeking answers than to be wrong because I never cared to find out why the resurrection of my Messiah and the feast of Yahweh got contaminated by a Babylonian fertility god. I'd rather be wrong seeking to find truth than to be wrong continuing to embrace that lie from hell. The whole world will make a vain, futile attempt next week to celebrate the resurrection by declaring that day to be Easter Sunday with Easter's eggs and Easter bunnies and Easter sunrise services. That's wrong. And it's a wrong that I cannot begin to comprehend and will never again be able to concede to. 
Now, I celebrated it for decades. But when somebody mentioned to me that it was a pagan festival tied to a fertility deity, I wanted to know the truth. I wasn't content to do unholy things and pretend they were holy if they weren't holy. I had to find out the truth. That desire to know the truth started me on a journey. Today, this is where my journey has brought me. Now, here's the way I deal with all of this. This is where my journey brought me. Others began the same journey in search of truth. And for some, their journey took them to an understanding that had them celebrating Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits last month. Some of them began the same journey, and their journey took them to an understanding that has them celebrating these feasts one day after we do. I do not find fault with that. Amen. I rejoice that we've all turned from the fellowship of a Babylonian goddess named Ishtar and turned to the holy writings of Moses that are about our Messiah seeking answers. We may not yet all have the right answer. Uh, we may not yet all have all knowledge that we need, but at least we're on a journey moving toward that, and we've moved away from the Babylonian fertility God. I rejoice in that. Yes. Amen. I, I, I don't find fault that we all don't have perfect knowledge yet. Instead, I rejoice that all three groups are on a journey seeking to celebrate what Yahweh did for us through Yeshua. And we're doing that by embracing His appointed times of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. I, I rejoice that all three groups have renounced Ishtar. Yes. I rejoice that all three groups have, have renounced the Roman Catholic Church's universalism and, and Satan's desire to be worshipped. Yes. This I know. What we don't yet fully know this I know. What we don't yet fully know, we would have never learned by staying where we were. That's right. Right. That's true. Yeshua said, Moses wrote about me. So Exodus 12 is about Yeshua. It tells us that he would be the Lamb of Yahweh without spot or blemish, that he would be killed on the 14th day of the month of Abib, and that's precisely what's happened. That is precisely what did happen. I want to take a moment and just show you a few of those, and we'll close. In John chapter 12, you there? Verse 1. Then Yeshua, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Woo! There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. A man he raised from the dead who had been dead for three days. Four, on the fourth day, they, he raised him from the dead. He's sitting down eating a meal with him. That's awesome. But notice that little bit of information. When the Bible gives you information, it's not trying to fill a page. You understand that? Right. When did he go to Bethany? When did he have that supper with them? Six days, six days Passover. Passover. When's Passover? 14th. 14th day of what month? Abib. The month of Abib. So we know exactly what night he and Lazarus sat down to supper. They sat down on Abib 9 and had dinner. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Abib 9. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Six days. Six days. So we know on Abib 9 they did that. Now drop down to verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of Yahweh. On the next day. That's important information. So what day is he making his triumphant entry into Jerusalem? The tenth of Abib. Why did he do it on the tenth of Abib? That's when he was supposed to. Look in Mark 9, excuse me, Mark 11. That's exactly right. Look at Mark 11. And, and they that went before, Mark 11, 9. They that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of Yahweh. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of Yahweh. Hosanna in the highest. And Yeshua 
entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the evening tide was come, he went out of Bethany. He went out unto Bethany with the twelve. He went back to Lazarus' home. So he went into Jerusalem and into the temple. Why did he do that? We just heard. Moses wrote about him. What did Moses say was to take place on the tenth day of the month of Abib? You bring a lamb into the home. What did uh, Yochanan, King James calls him John the Baptizer. What did he say when he saw Yeshua coming to be baptized? Behold the Lamb of Yahweh. Well, if that is the Lamb of Yahweh, then where has he got to be on the tenth day of Abib? he got to be in Yahweh's house. So on the tenth of Abib, he goes into his father's house and just has a seat. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. Mark 11 tells us, that, tells us what he did on the uh, 11th day of Abib. Mark 11 tells us that he left Bethany going back to Jerusalem, that he went to a fig tree. And uh, were no figs on it, so he put a curse on it. The fig tree dry, dried up from the roots. He goes back to his father's house, and what does he do? That's right. He cleaned up his father's house. He sat there on the tenth of a bead to let them examine him, but he was also examining them, and he cleaned up his father's house. In verse 20 of Mark 11, <clears throat> all the way through the 14th chapter, the 11th verse, it tells us what he did on the 12th day of Abib. Uh, on the 12th day of Abib, they're returning back to Jerusalem, and that's when Peter saw the fig tree. And Peter said, Behold, the fig tree that you cursed is withered and died. And then we have that great exhortation, that, that great teaching on faith that he shares with Peter and the disciples. He goes on into Jerusalem. They start asking him questions. And he's, oh, some of the, the awesome things that come forth out of his heart and out of his mouth uh, on that day as he's teaching them. Mark 14, verse 12 and following tells us that on Abib 13, they prepare a room for Passover. But now let's talk about Abib 14. Listen again. I want you to just listen to what Exodus 12 says about uh, Abib 14. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And that does, again, doesn't say in the evening. In the Hebrew it says what? You'll kill it between the evenings. So every new day begins in the evening. So the 14th would start at sunset and end at sunset. Between those two evenings, the lamb will be slain. So according to Mark 14, 17, on the 13th of Abib, Yeshua is having a meal with his disciples in Lazarus' home. Or excuse me, I said that wrong. On the 13th day of Abib, he's in the upper room where they prepared for the Passover. He's having a meal with his disciples. Right? Right. When the sun sets on that day, we have entered into the 14th of Abib. Correct? So here's what we know when we read Mark chapter 14. He shared a meal with his disciples. Evening came, the 14th has begun. You, uh, Judas is dispatched away. They sing a song. They leave the upper room and they go into Gethsemane. They pray. Mark 14.32 says... He gets arrested. <clears throat> He's taken to the chief priest. He stands trial before the Sanhedrin. They sought for a, a blemish, but they could find none. Through false witnesses, he is condemned and he is mistreated. <clears throat> Mark chapter 15 tells us, that in the early morning hours, still the 14th of Abib, he's carried away to Pilate. Mark 15 tells us that Pilate scourged him, then nailed him to a stake. Verse 25, Mark 15, 25 says this, And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. 
That would have been about 9 o'clock in the morning on the 14th of Abib, they crucify him. That is betwixt the evenings, between the evenings. Now, traditionally, in order to follow the instruction of Exodus 12, the lamb, we're told by Josephus, was slain at 3 o'clock in the afternoon between the evenings. So listen to this, Mark 15, 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So from midday to 3 p.m., it's dark. Verse 34, and at the ninth hour, which would have been three o'clock, Yeshua cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, 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 lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calls Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink saying, let alone. Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Yeshua cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. At the exact precise time that Josephus tells us that the lamb was slain on the 14th of Abib. Between the evenings of Abib 14, at precisely the right time, Yahweh's lamb was killed for our sins. Yahweh had established a pattern, a shadow so that we would know of a certainty what he was doing and when he would do it. And for 1,400 years, it got rehearsed year after year after year. So we would know what he was doing and when he would do it. And that pattern is fulfilled perfectly by Yeshua from the tenth of Abib all the way through uh, the resurrection and through the giving of the Holy Spirit. These are details that those who celebrate the fertility rituals of Ishtar can never see and never appreciate. They are blinded by demons who have them dying eggs and talking about rabbits and focused on sunrises. It was not until I began to embrace Passover that I began to see the beauty and power of what Yahweh had done for us through his Messiah. Once you turn to Torah, you see that Moses wrote about Yeshua. Yes, sir. And th then once you turn to Torah and see that Moses was writing about Yeshua, you come back and read the Gospels, and you see the pattern played out perfectly. He showed a pattern that would perfectly represent how he would deliver us and how every part of it would take place. Our Elohim knows the end from the beginning. That's right. Isn't it amazing? 1,400 years before it ever takes place, some 1,400 years, roughly. He could set forth a pattern that would show you exactly how it was going to take place. He knows the end from the beginning. There's none like him. So in light of all this, let me close with just a couple of things. <coughs> Let me uh, close first by saying this. I do have a chart that, that charts out a Beeb 10 through a Beeb 16. And it talks about what Torah says about it and what the Gospels say about it and shows us how he fits that pattern. If any of you would like a copy of that, all you got to do is let me know and I will email you a copy of that. Just mention it on Facebook, send me a text, send me an email, and I'll make sure I get that to you. Also, tonight at sunset begins Abib 10. Mark it. Bring the Lamb of Yahweh into your home. Make a conscious effort to be aware of Him and what He did for you. Make sure He would be comfortable in your residence. Abib 10 marks the day that we should begin to remove leaven out of our homes in preparation for Passover and unleavened bread. This not only involves removing actual leavened things, such as food items, but leaven represents what? Sin. Sin and what else? Sin and false doctrine. Begin to get those things out of your life and out of your house. Look around. 
What books are left over that teach false doctrine that ought to be gotten out of your house? What items and images might still be lurking? I know last year I was impressed strongly to go back to start looking through pictures of where I was proudly celebrating Ishtar and Christmas. And to get the, I've got enough pictures to, to uh, remember my family by without having pictures of me and uh, doing Easter things or Christmas things. So those are some things that I was convicted of to get rid of and get them out of my house. Beginning tonight, as we move to, through the week, start getting leaven out of your house and out of your life. Um, Abib 14 begins Wednesday evening. Abib 14 begins Wednesday evening, but the lamb is slain when? Between the evenings. All right, so that means several things for us. Number one, we will meet as we have traditionally done for the last several years, Wednesday before sunset to commemorate the Last Supper. The Last Supper was not Passover. So we will commemorate the Last Supper. This is the night that the Yeshua and the disciples shared a meal. They took communion. They sang a song. They went out into the garden to pray. We're not commanded to commemorate this night, but I've always felt a strong compulsion to do so. The Bible says that often you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so in remembrance of him. So that is the night that it was began. I see this night, the night of... Uh, the, the night before the lamb is slain. I see that night as, as a night of consecration. As, as Messiah on that night knows that the next day he'll be crucified. That night he takes that bread and said, this is my body that's broken for you. He's, he is committing himself to that task. This is my blood which is shed for you. He is committing himself and consecrating himself to that task. So I see that night as a night that needs to be remembered, and we will do that on Wednesday night. On Thursday, we'll meet before sunset. We'll begin promptly at 7 p.m. in order to observe Passover. At sunset, Thursday evening, and we will be meeting at Pleasant Grove Community Center. At sunset Thursday evening, the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. So that makes Friday what? First fruits. Say again? No, not quite first fruits. Makes it a mega Sabbath. Right? Exodus 12 teach, speaks of it. Uh, and John chapter 19 speaks of it. John 19, 31 says this. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. The word is mega. Uh, so the Friday, Thursday evening, as we're uh, sharing Passover, it begins unleavened bread. And Friday will be a mega Sabbath. Keep that in mind. Remember uh, that, that Friday is a very holy day. Uh, we'll meet back Saturday morning, Sabbath day morning. And that will be first fruits. Because he was raised from the dead, not after three days, but he was raised on the third day. And so Sabbath morning, again, we'll be at the Civic Center, and we will be celebrating the resurrection of our Messiah. Thank you all for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you. Have a great afternoon.